if I stand over there, I'll feel like I'm in the EU nation uh, kind of environment. And I'd rather be here with you guys, so I hope you don't mind. Do you like rock music? Anybody? Oh, that's awesome. Something a little, a little harder, like Metallica, Iron Maiden, something like that. Awesome, awesome. So I, I, I got the right audience. Perfect. Every time I go to a city like Bilbao for the first time, I'm here for the second time, but it's the first time I was doing my small research. I do a research on the local rock scene, on the local metal bands. And I was very surprised to find out Bilbao has some really solid bands, really solid bands. I, I found like a dozen, and all of them were good. But I decided to show you three of them that really got my, my interest. So the first band, well, disclaimer, a lot of men with long hair, a lot of men with long beards, evil looks, all that stuff. But you know, that's rock. It's this kind of stereotype. How do you call that? The Bellu? The Bellu? So these guys, they, they sing in, they're from Bilbao. They sing in the Basque language. I, I have no clue what they're saying. But it sounds like Metallica, so it's really cool. If, uh, you know, I'm a fan. I'd like to return to the people who make me happy. I want to make, make them happy. So if you have a chance, go check them out. These guys, they look even more evil than the previous ones. So they're, they're called Rise to Fall. Really technical, a little bit more extreme, all right? But they're also from Bilbao. Um, if you're into heavy metal, go check them out. And these guys, they are really extreme. Like, they are into death metal. This kind of vocal. It's like throwing up and the music is playing on the side. They're called in Thousand Lakes, but I, I like them. They're pretty good. So free local band from Bilbao, you guys are lucky. I don't have this kind of band in my own town, so go check them out. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a big fan of music. Right? I've been listening to rock and, and heavy metal for almost, I don't know, 25 years now. I was in the fourth grade. And I'm this crazy type of guy that's always with the headphones and wears metal t-shirts. I'm now with my suit, technically. Now, usually you see me with this uh, shorts and then with a metal t-shirt and big, bigger beard and all that, so I'm now official. And I, I follow the bands that I like. And um, once I saw an interview by this guy. He's called Marty Friedman. I'm sure all the women in the room are thinking, what a hair. Yeah. <laughs> He has a really nice hair. So this guy, he is an ex-player by the band called Megadeth. You know Megadeth? Dave Mustaine? So this guy, he's one of the most talented guitar players of our time. He's really, really good. And not that super fast good, but really melodical. He knows how to compose stuff. And I saw this interview and I was saying, oh really? If this guy was on the stage instead of me, and if he just changed a few words, not to be music specific, you wouldn't be able to tell him apart from an agile coach, a Kanban coach, whatever coach. And I thought that I have to show you some of this interview because it's phenomenal. So listen what he's saying. I will read that out loud. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of guitar hero types have a lot of people copying them. You can get pretty close to your heroes by learning all the mechanics. But copying others is not necessarily the best thing because you might try to play something really far away from, from what you can actually get under your fingers. This is a tip from a musician. What, what is he saying? He's saying that when you copy something, all you can get is the outside. It's the shell. Some of you may, may know that Toyota, they, they invite people to their factories to see how they are doing stuff. And to our Western minds, this is almost criminal because we would all be afraid that they will steal what we're doing and they will apply it somewhere else. And they will 
break our competitive advantage. But what Toyota know, these guys, they know that you can only see the practices. You can only see the shell. How they got there, you cannot see. What the thinking was to, to get there, you cannot see. It's only the shell. And the shell, we can all do the shell. But tomorrow, Toyota will, will be different. The day after tomorrow, they will evolve even faster, and we will still be with this shell. Uh, do you know what this is? Anybody heard about a cargo cult? It's a very funny story. I, I want to share that story. This is a plane, looks like a plane, that's built out of straw, like dry grass. Right? During one of the, world, the, the wars in the 20th century, the US Army had to build bases on some islands in the Pacific. And those islands, they were inhabited by local tribes that had never seen our civilization before. And when the US people went there and brought them a ba batteries, clothes, candy, uh, devices, anything, the local tribes were like, oh my god, these are our gods. Where do they have those things from? And then the war ended, and the US people went home, and suddenly the cargo was gone. No batteries, no clothes, no candies. And the local tribes, they didn't realize why this was gone, why this miracle of heaven disappeared. And to try to get it back, they started building those planes out of straw, hoping that the cargo will get back, summoning the cargo back. And that's the, the real description of what, what, you, what you get when you copy the shell. That's why. They saw the planes, they built the planes, but what, why there's no cargo? Because they, re, they didn't realize what it, why it was there in the first place. And uh, yeah, this is Marty Friedman talking, right? <laughs> he's a musician. Next thing that he's saying, there's no course for that. And the context here is becoming as good as somebody else. For example, we want to become as good as Toyota, as good as whoever. There is no course for that. There is no method to it. The only way to really get into it, if you really want to play like someone, is understand there is no easy way. And I am very much tempted to say that there is no a safe way. The guys that come closest to me are the ones that play in my band and have dissected those songs to a professional level. It's a non-mechanical approach. And I'd like us to focus on this last sentence about the mechanical approach. When we go adopt Scrum, Agile, Kanban, whatever, we get trained to do certain things. The ceremonies, uh, the meetings, the uh, retrospection meeting, whatever. And then we start repeating that. And for a while, it's OK. But this is a mechanical approach. We need to understand that if you want to be as good as Google, we cannot just copy the OKR framework. We need to start thinking like Google. And how, how we do this, it's, it's not easy, and we have to dissect what they're doing. We have to do it then stop, analyze, learn, stop, analyze, learn. Do this 100 times, 1,000 times, and only then it will start to make sense. So if we focus on the mechanics, we'll be like robots. No intelligence, very efficient, but no intelligence. The next thing that Marty Friedman says, ditch the scales already. A scale is, is an exercise that you do on the guitar in order to obtain muscle memory. So you've seen those guitar players that do it super fast. It's just memory. They don't think about it. They do it automatically. These are scales. People tend to talk about music in relation to scales, but I don't think that way at all. I think in terms of phrases and melodies and the interesting little inroads that go from one place to another over a chord or a series of chords. You might wonder, what, what, what's going on here? What's the common thing between this and Kanban? Well, Marty says, melodies, and I hear flow. 
I, I bet you've heard some song or some instrumental that touched you emotionally, and it wasn't played technically flawless. There were a few mistakes here and there, but it, 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 it touched you. The music was nice. It was really good to experience it. And, and those musicians, they, they don't care that much about every note being hit in the, the right time. Of course, it's important, but a few errors, it's OK. And, and it's the same with, with producing value. If you care about the flow, you may skip one meeting here, uh, or you can do some little shortcut over there. But if flow is optimized in general, then you're doing the right thing. We should care about the flow on a, on a global level in the company. Almost the last one from Marty Friedman, so stick with me a few more. People want warm-up exercises and shortcuts. There aren't any. Get out there and play in bands to anyone you can. That's how you find out how to play well. In your bedroom, you won't have the right stimulus to play for real and avoid the F star CK ups. I'm not allowed to say this. Right? If this is not deliver faster, deliver frequently, I don't know what it is. Even musicians tell us to deliver faster and deliver frequently, because that's how we learn again. We deliver what we, what we can, right? Sometimes you play, you pay, play the wrong note, but you learn from that, you play again. It's the same with software. It's the same with anything else. You have to get out there and every time deliver no matter what. You know what Wright Hoffman, or Reed Hoffman, I'm not sure, the, the founder of LinkedIn, what he said? If you're not ashamed by your initial release, then you're too late. So it might be embarrassing, but get out there and do it. You will be faster in the end. And this is the last one from Marty Friedman. He says the following. Here's a great tip. One thing you want to avoid is playing fast unless it's absolutely necessary. If it's not needed, then playing fast totally sucks. If you get a call from Elton John about doing some session, He's not going to want to hear your eight-finger tapping arpeggios. He'll send you straight out the door. Sir Paul McCartney won't want your insane diminished SH star T either. You'll get fired. Again, it's a bit abstract. But to me, this is a slide about systems thinking. If one team in the organization is playing very fast, the drums, because they can, because they have the best scrum master, because they got the most training. But then the rest of the teams are still learning to hit the, the simplest chord. Do you get the melody? Well, you get some melody, but it's distorted, right? So you have to be that fast in order for the whole system to work well. Don't optimize just locally. Optimize the whole. And I will give you my tips a bit later on how to optimize the whole. But think about music, and every instrument is one of your teams. It has to flow together. I am now running a PDF because we had some technical issues, and I'm going to spoil the surprise. But do you know who this guy is? Quickly. It's Bruce Dickinson. This guy, he's a world-class fencer. He's a novelist a screenwriter, a radio host, a beer brewer, by the way, the beer, very good, a motivational speaker, commercial and private pilot, a successful one, as he's still alive, and his Iron Maiden's legendary singer. This is Mr. Bruce Dickinson. He's one of the best vocalists in, in heavy metal of all time. And I want to play you two short videos by this guy in order to convince you that rock, rock people like him and Marty Friedman are the same as us. The video quality is not perfect, so please excuse me for that, but it's some, um, how will it happen? I hope we have the sound. And just so you know, this video they are now, sorry, 
What's going on? OK. So this video, he talks about how he managed to become all these things. A writer, a pilot, uh, a metal legend, and all that stuff. So they ask him how, how he was able to do so, and this is what he says. We need the sound, please. <laughs> this room over there is huge. OK. <laughs> your achievements are truly inspiring. What is your advice for keeping motivation and focus <laughs> during a very, very busy schedule? <laughs> well, I am actually uh, try and do things uh, one thing at a time because it's all I can manage. Um, and uh, I discovered that if I try to do two things at a time, um, like for example, eating with a knife and fork, <laughs> whilst at the same time trying to play chess, one of them has to suffer inevitably. So as simple as it may sound, just do whatever it is you're doing, do that. And then do something else. All this stuff about multitasking, right? It's rubbish. <laughs> rubbish, absolute rubbish. Women cannot multitask. <laughs> Men cannot multitask. <laughs> But some people are better at going from one thing to the other thing to the other thing to the other thing, and back to the other thing, and everything else like that. But they, if they're going to be successful at that, they're going to do one thing at a time and change rapidly from one to the other. Okay. So that's what Mr. Dickinson is saying. I'm trying to do one thing at a time because it's all I can manage. This guy is telling us to do Kanban, right? Because Kanban asks us to limit work in progress, and that's what this phenomenal person is also advising us to do. He was able to achieve so much. And if you, if you, if you noticed in the end, he said, we should be good at switching from one thing to, to, to the other, from one thing to the other. And I think that's the core to business agility as well. Being able, as businesses, as companies, to switch quickly from one thing to the other. And it takes a lot of work, a lot of discipline. And again, I'm going to share what I think about this a little bit later. But let me now play you the second video by this guy. And now they ask him why he quit Iron Maiden. He, he, he played with Iron Maiden for, I don't know, five, 10 years. Then he quit for his solo career. And then he went back to Iron Maiden to become the, the legend he is. And now they ask him why, why he quit in, in the first place. And that's what he says. Anyway, I quit Iron Maiden. And famously, nobody knows why. Not even me. <laughs> and people find that hard to believe. That you would just go, I think I'm going to stop. And... Um, that's what happened. And people go, well, surely, did you hate them? I went, no, I, I thought they were all quite nice chaps. We were making lots of money. Uh, it, it, artistically, we were going and playing for all these people. Uh, it was just, I felt that there was something out there in the world, something else. What? I don't know. If I knew what it was, I wouldn't go looking for it. <laughs> But you're not going to find it in the institution that is or was I made or any other institution. Because we all surround ourselves in cotton wool and institutions. It's a comfortable place to be. Just a quick pause. Right here he's saying we all surround ourselves with cotton wool and institutions because it's a comfortable place to be. I want to talk about that in a few minutes. Just a few more minutes until the video ends. And when you have nothing, when you have absolutely zero, I can sign a piece of paper that says, 
I owe you $300,000. I owe you $300 million. Because I have nothing. I don't care. I have nothing to lose. Maybe everything to gain. You can take a chance. When you're a billionaire, like Bill Gates, you can also do anything you want. Because you have lots you can lose without giving shit. But when you're in the middle, you're kind of a prisoner. And I, I, I realized that my life, I, I, I could see myself at the age, approaching 30 years old, and I'm like, if I get to 60, and I've never gone out and found out what else is in the world, wow, how sad would that be? You could end up like one of those 60 year old people who was just like bitter and I wished I'd done this, I wished I'd done that, I wished, wish, wish, wish. So, what precipitated me leaving Iron Maiden was one quote in the LA Times by Henry Miller, the artist. And I'll paraphrase it because I can't remember the exact quote, but it's basically all growth is an unpremeditated leap in the dark with no idea of where you are going to land. This last quote. I think it's one of the best things somebody has ever told in a non-agile presentation. But let me first talk about this cotton walls and institutions. Have you guys heard about the Scrum religion? I, I've heard about Scrum religion. And by the way, I have nothing against Scrum. I think Scrum is great. It helps. But what really gets to me, grinds my gears, is when somebody says, this is what Scrum says, that's what we're supposed to do. This is, to me, a cotton wall and an institution. It guides us from the outside world, but it's actually inhibiting our curiosity. And Bruce Dickinson says, if I knew what's out, what was out there, I wouldn't go there looking for it. And this guy, he was a millionaire at the age of 30. He was making a lot of money, he could get anything from the, from the life he wanted, but he still quit because he was curious to explore what else was there in, in the wild. And I think that's what we all should do. We should have a starting point, which is what? Start where you are. And then we should be curious, go explore what's else, what else is in the wild. And this is this ph phenomenal quote, all growth is a leap in the dark, a spontaneous, unpremeditated act without the benefit of experience. And to me, this is what going agile as a business really means. If somebody comes to you and tells you, this is where we're going to go, and this is how much time it's going to take, this is how much money it's going to take, I don't think they know what they're saying. I think they're just trying to say something. Getting agile as a business is really hard. And I've built a company with some other people, and I, I, I think I know how hard it is. So it's not easy. It's the most difficult thing you can do to be an agile business as a business. I'm not talking an agile team, because I don't think there's such a thing. I'm talking about a, an agile company. So um, you have to accept the fact that it's not safe. You're going to fail at least a few times, whatever failure means. I mean, I don't know. But because if you learn something, it's not, it's not a failure, right? But it's not going to be easy. It's, it's a journey. It's not a one-off project. It's not a one-off transformation. You do it all the time for as much time you're a company. So uh, we're now approaching the most interesting <laughs> part of the presentation when the best mus musician is going to give you some advice. Are you ready to jump into this? This guy. This guy is going to give you his 10 tips about business agility. He's not as good as Bruce Dickinson, but he knows something. <laughs> so, did you recognize me? All right, seriously. 10 tips. How much time do you have? Carlos? Uh, four, four, 
4.30, oh wow. I think I started early. Okay, maybe we should do it like 30 tips, not 10. <laughs> All right, my first tip, actually let me first go ahead through this definition of a very wise person. He said, business agility is the ability of your business to effectively and efficiently satisfy its target markets through rapid experimentation and learning. To me, this is business agility. All right, you, you may have some other definition, that's fine, but when I talk about business agility, that's what I mean. How we can quickly turn our ship around and go get that opportunity quickly. Because business agility means we see an opportunity, we are swift to go get this opportunity, right? So my tip number one is mature your Kanban implementation. If you're not doing Kanban, please start doing Kanban and then mature your implementation. And this is a very right conference, very right event to be in because we talk about maturity and how maturity matters. Um, I, you know, I talk to a lot of customers and a lot of prospects and when they come to us, the majority of them, they, they have no idea what Kanban really is. I mean, well, it's not fair to say that. They, they know just the very basics, all right? They know just to visualize some work with three columns, sticky notes on the wall, and that's all. They, they have no idea how much more there is. So we, we should together work towards making these practices and principles more and more understood by the, the people out there so that they can really benefit from the Kanban method on a large scale. And this is the first thing. Start doing Kanban and then mature it. My second tip is don't pile up waste. How many software people we have in the room? Anybody? Software people dealing with software. All right, it's almost half. Okay, the rest of the people, please excuse me for like two minutes. I'm gonna talk about software, but I think the principles are universally applicable. In Kanban we have these five priorities when we work on our software, on the product. First, customer issues. When, whenever we have a customer issue, somebody opens a support page and submits an issue to us, this is automatically the most important thing for the development team. They stop doing whatever they're doing and they go fix the issue. Then come regression issues. Those are things that used to work, but now are not working for whatever reason. We broke it, that's the reason. We broke it, things happen. And then internal issues, those are bugs that we find ourselves through QA, automation testing, all that stuff. Then it comes the mighty word, technical debt. It's fourth priority. And then on the last fifth position, it's new features. And now it's the time you chase me out the door and you kick me in the ass. How come a product company that's technically selling features to their customers, prioritizes features on the last position. How come? It's like mortgage. Unless you pay your mortgage every month, you're suddenly out of home. Yeah? The bank come and take your house. So these four things, they are an investment. You have to pay every month, every day, every week, constantly, so that you actually have time to work on features. And we are the living proof. For the past four or five years, we've had a monthly release every single month, and every month we've had at least three, four new features. And guess how many bugs do we have? I mean, customer issues. I'm not here to show off, but I have to show off, because it's zero. We have a backlog of zero open customer issues. And when I present the slide at conferences, I always ask, is there anybody in the room with a backlog of zero customer open issues? Okay, I, only, I, I saw only once a hand go up, and it was by a guy who later said that they had not yet launched or something like that. So it's very, 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 very rare to have a product with a backlog of zero customer issues. And I'm wondering why. 
because it's how it should be. Our customers are paying us money to use our software, and then they complain, and then we ask them to wait for undefined amount of time to get this issue resolved. It sounds illogical, doesn't it? So my tip is don't pile up waste. Those issues, they are waste by any definition of waste. So don't allow them to pile up. If you have too many already, start fixing. Each time you release, which is hopefully frequently, have less, one less, one issue less than the last time, until you finally fix them all. This thing is doing miracles for our company, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense just when you think about it, but it, it's super often when, when customers come to us and, and tell us, well, that, that was fast. What was fast? Well, that was fast. My third tip, be fanatical about customer support. What you're seeing here is, is a chart that's called cycle time scatter plot. It shows you on the, on the x-axis, it shows a timeline, and on the y-axis, it shows cycle time. Cycle time basically means how much time something took to complete. It's a little bit difficult to read, but this says 70%, this says 85%, and this says 95%. And if you go all the way to the left, it says one, two, three. This is one day, two days, three days. I'm showing you the real data from our support board in Kanbanize where you see visualized thousands of issues. Whatever, I, I mean, these are not just bugs. These are customers asking for advice, customers um, not knowing how to work with the software, anything. And what I'm showing you here is that in 85% of all cases, we were able to complete those within two days. This means, in, in the case of bugs, it means getting back to the customer, providing a fix, asking if it's resolved, and then receiving a confirmation. So we do this within two days, 85% of the time. 95% of the time, we're able to do it within three days. And those are calendar days, not just weekdays. And of course, there are things I could have removed with Photoshop, but I decided I should be honest. Sometimes we screw up. <laughs> we're human, right? But my point is different. This is what I think support should look like wherever you go, not just Kanbanize, because when somebody gets to your support, they really want to do something with this piece of software, right? You wouldn't care to contact support of Microsoft unless you wanted to do something with the Microsoft products. And if your support is too slow to respond, first of all, you're missing a very big opportunity to get these people, why they need this thing? What's the scenario? What's the use case? You just lose this opportunity because they, they submit the ticket and they, they hear from you uh, after two weeks, they already forgot what they wanted. But if you get back to them right away, they will be willing to work with you and share why they want what they want. And this helps you to create better products. And if you want to get to business agility, you need to know what a good product is, right? If you are to satisfy your target markets, which was the definition of business agility, how do you know which these markets are? Well, you have to talk to people. And when they come to you willing to talk to you, if you have them wait for two weeks, you're, you're losing this opportunity. And even worse, if they know that it will take two weeks to, to, to get back, they wouldn't even write. So you miss this opportunity completely. Have you, have you had a problem with a software, whatever kind of software tool, and, and then you thought, maybe I should write to support? Nah, it will take a month to get this fixed. I, I've experienced that. It, it's, it's really bad. And my next tip is a continuation of this third one. Being fanatical about customer support allows you to be fanatical about customer feedback. And this is a board that we maintain manually in Kanbanize. So this, every, every small rectangle that you see here represents a feature. 
<laughs> you see we have a lot of feature requests, right? And then within those, those cards, you can have one to usually like, like 30 similar requests. So if somebody asks, hey, I want to have uh, the background color to be blue, and then a second guy asks for the same, we put it in the same card. And we have this done manually every single time. So what you're seeing here is essentially thousands of feedback pieces, actually thousands, that we have ordered manually <laughs> with bare hands. No automation systems, no voting systems, manually. We go through them, we read them one by one, ask the questions, the customers, why, 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 why do you need this? Get the feedback, get the use case scenario, and then we prioritize it. If just one person asks for this, we put it here under low priority. If there are more people asking for it, we put it right here. And then if there are very many people asking for it, we put it over here and we, we actually go ahead and do it. But the key here is that we, we care so deeply about this that we don't want to put an automated voting system about features. And our customers are not very happy about it, to be honest, because it's, it's simpler to go and vote for something. But then we can't get the feedback from them. Why do you need this? Who are you? Because you can't create features for everybody. You need to have your personas. You need to know who you're building for. So this is our way to be fanatic about customer feedback, because that's how we know what a good product is. That's how we can remain agile as a company, because we know what our customers want. All right. My next tip, it's all managers should be teachers. I don't know for you, but in, in, in my experience, the way training and consulting usually works is teams get trained. About 80% of the time, the management is not there. So the teams get, get trained. The managers do something else because they're very busy. And then the teams are expected to go back to doing what they're doing, and suddenly everybody's going to be agile. I don't think it works like that. Actually, if there's one team to be trained, it's the management team. And if you can, go train the management team. And then I would say the management has to train their subordinates, and their subordinates have to train their subordinates. It has to be a master-apprentice relationship. Of course, I'm not saying you shouldn't get help. Get help from professionals who know how to do it. But ultimately, it's our responsibility as managers to train our people. If we delegate this, I don't think it's going to work well in the long run. That's why Toyota are so successful. They, they had this master-apprentice relationship for like forever. They have the, the senior guy teaching everybody below him or her, and then they pass on. And this is actually what Teichi Ono says. People who can't understand numbers are useless. If numbers are not visible, also bad. But people who only look at the numbers are the worst of all. So if we are the kind of managers who only look at the numbers, then we're the worst of all. We should be caring enough to teach our people. All right, sixth tip, foster horizontal leadership. We all work in, well, maybe not all, but the majority of us work in companies where you have this type of hierarchy. You have the C-level folks, the SVPs, directors, and some sort of hierarchy, right? But value doesn't get generated like that. Value gets generated horizontally. You have people from multiple departments, marketing, sales, R&D, they all collaborate with each other, right? That's how we create value. It's not top-down, it's horizontal. But for, for good or worse, we work in some forms, forms of silos. And then there are those people who can effectively go engage this other silo or this other silo or this other silo. These are typically project managers or product managers. Maybe there are others, but those are the two personas I've identified. And my, my advice is to find those guys who can easily engage others and work with them effectively and just give them all the freedom they need. 
Sometimes it's about, well, not sometimes, it's almost always is, it's about people. It's not just about tools, it's not just about processes. We have to have the right people. And when I go to an Agile conference, sometimes people will say project managers and they laugh as if it's a, a bad word or something. I, I don't get it, <laughs> but to me, project management is not a bad word. It's just something we have to do sometimes. Um, so find those horizontal guys, promote them, give them bigger salaries, whatever. They will do 80% of the work for you. Just identify them and, uh, and go ahead. Okay, we're almost approaching the end of my presentation. My eighth tip is convert hippos to hypos. Hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. And then hypo is a high probability option. The hippo, this, this guy, the big fat guy in my company, guess who is it? It's me. It's literally me. So if you have an opinion, and if I have an opinion that is different from yours in my company, guess who wins? Well, I, I win because I'm the CEO. But if you have some data, and if I am that reasonable, which I think I am, then the conversation changes. We hear very often about these three hour long meetings where people fight, we should do this, we should do that, or uh, you know, they, they just can't decide or they vote what we should build next. By the way, voting is, is the worst idea. So, um, so, so what I, I preach after reading a book that's called You Should Test That. I, I forgot the author, but the name of the book was You Should Test That. And the author says very pragmatically, if you don't know the answer, test it. It's that simple. So if you want to, be, if you want to build A or B and you have no data, run a small experiment. Collect the data. And then do the conversation again. Should we build A or should we build B? So when you have the data and when, when you don't take decisions out of your gut, because you know what's in your gut, right? then those guys <laughs> that always go for the worst option, they can't say anything about it. High probability option is something that you can do with very good opportunity that, um, that will um, make you return. All right. About experiments, I've, we've conducted many experiments with, with our company, but I, I learned relatively late what was a good experiment after burning a lot of cash. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, uh, there was nobody to tell me. So you know about the PDCA. I, I won't talk about that. But when you run an experiment, I have a few tips. First of all, define the duration of the experiment. We've run experiments at Kanbanize that span one year, and it doesn't work. You know, one year is too much. I would say one month is a, an optimal duration of an experiment. If you can make it in one month, perfect. One quarter for a big company, also good. More than that, things start to get uncertain. So define the duration, define the budget. An experiment has to have a budget attached to it. Whatever amount is, you have to be fully aware that you can burn those money and lose them all without getting punished. But be explicit. Those are money you can spend, completely burn, well, not on whiskey and all that stuff, but invest them in something. Even if you burn them all, we won't punish you. And then what's the result? First, you must have learned something. And second, you should have better confidence what to do next. We've made this mistake a lot of times when we learn something, but we didn't know what to do with this learning. So you have to think a few, a few iterations further. OK, I want to learn this because I need it for taking that decision. Experimenting for the sake of experimenting is, is kind of dull. Don't, don't do it. I've done it many times. It doesn't work. All right. When we talk about turning the ship around, that's, that's my my, my thinking. And uh, as, as I mentioned in the panel, we've been experimenting with this in, in Kanbanize for the past, I don't know, six years. How to scale Kanban across the whole organization. I believe, and I think we've proven it with our, with our company, that when you connect 
the whole company at each level with a Kanban system, and then those Kanban systems are connected to one another, it's a much easier thing for the guys at the top, no matter how high that top is, to just pull a lever and then suddenly the ship starts to, to turn right. It's a, more like a tank. You pull that and then you go left. You pull right, you go right. It's because those systems are all connected. They're all WIP limited. So when somebody at the top wants to build something, even if communication in the, in the lower levels in, in the organization is not perfect, these guys will still have to work on what this guy, this guy wants, the, the CEO. And I've read about the most frequent failures of CEOs, why they, why they happen. And guess what? CEOs say that, I forgot how, maybe 90% of the time, they failed because they could not execute on their strategy. It's not that they didn't have the strategy, they had it, it was perfect in their heads. But they could not deploy it, they could not execute it. And I think this, this combination of scaled Kanban across the organization, with whip limits everywhere, visualization everywhere, is the best thing, at least that I'm aware of right now, how to manage an agile company. Because you can very quickly change direction with this kind of thing. And I use it. My, our customers, well, not, not all of them, but some of them are doing this, and they are loving it because they, they, they see the, the power of the solution. Just quickly changing gears. And my last tip, but I think the most important one, is to be inclusive. Just like music. <laughs> when I go to conferences like this, and when I'm wearing my Iron Maiden shirts, <laughs> I told you about that, Sometimes people say, hey, nice shirt. For example, this guy, this was in Greece. He was the waiter in my hotel. His name is Giorgio in, in Greece, in Greek. He said, hey, Iron Maiden. He said, yeah, Iron Maiden. And we hugged and we you know, took a picture. That's where we stopped, all right? But we took a picture. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was thinking, wow, music can, can connect to complete strangers. I could have easily thought, hmm, this waiter, he knows nothing. And he could easily have thought, hmm, this stupid metalhead, what does he know about life? But we didn't care about this. And I think that's what we should do as a community. We should invite everybody with good ideas to participate and to develop this whole thing together. My Kanban is not better than your Kanban or your Spotify model or your safe or whatever. We just have to evolve experimentally. I think that's Kanban's most powerful practice. Whatever you're doing, no matter how bad it is, if you evolve it, eventually it will get better. So thank you very much. That's what I have for today. <laughs> I think we have one hour for questions. <laughs> So, if you want to ask me something, please go ahead. Yes, we have a question over. Just one second for the microphone. Uh, I, I was just wondering um, if you already have Jira in your organization, but let's say you want to explore Kanbanize, for example, mm -hmm. to what extent can they be integrated or connected? If you want to connect artifacts in Kanbanize with artifacts you might have in Jira. Yes, yeah, we do this, of course. Jira is uh, a factor in, in our world. You can't um, ignore that. <clears throat> so we integrate with Jira. And in fact, what we do, if I go back a few slides, imagine this is a team right here using Jira. What we can do with our software is have all those team, teams using Kanbanize and then build the whole portfolio up via Kanbanize, and then feed work from this Kanbanize board to this Jira system, for example, and then get the status back in. So that's, that's what we can do. It, it requires a bit of tweaking, so it's not like click two buttons and it works, but, but yes, we can do that. Is it like Cycler or something? Or? Yeah, we work with a partner. They're called Cycler. If you've heard about Zapier, 
it's the same thing like Zapier, but it's built into our software, so it's transparent for the user. You don't have to go buy Cycler to do this. You, you do it through Kanbanize, everything. We have a question over there? OK. Uh, I was just looking at your website earlier. You guys don't do a very good job of calling it out, because I couldn't find anything about integrating with Jira on the website. <laughs> so, yep. so that would be good to know, because that's for a lot of companies, there's going to be limitations. Like, I can't move off of Jira. I've got millions of records in there that will never go away. So yeah. I don't really have any other options. But I'd love to get a better tool when it comes to Kanban. Lots okay. of tools. <laughs> OK. At least now we know. But uh, I take the feedback. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? We have plenty of time, you know. <laughs> All right. We have one here. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, in the day that you um, tested custom and new features mm -hmm. for a period in-house for a period of six months. Yeah. That's a very long time yeah. for that feedback loop. Can you talk a little bit more about why you have such a long time for feed that feedback? I need to rephrase that. Thank you for pointing it out. It's, it's often six months until we get something that we like ourselves. Because some, sometimes we build a prototype, even if it's just if it's just in, in vision, you know, guys, in vision where you just draw a mock-up with some basic interaction. We, we do that. We don't like it. Scratch it. <laughs> Next, we do that. This time, we do some front-end development just to, to get a better feeling. We don't like it. Scratch it. Sometimes we scratch a feature. For example, this last timeline feature that we had, well, I think we scratched it four times <laughs> before we actually dared to deliver it. And I know I'm contradicting a bit to, if you're not ashamed, <laughs> you're too late. But sometimes it's just too shameful. <laughs> no, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a long cycle because you, it's, it's, it's discovering what you want to, to deliver. It's a very early on. But when, we, when uh, we have this early adopters program, so when we have something that's at least working with bugs, we show it to these early adopters, we get the feedback, and then we improve. And even the first release is always a bit you know, shaky. The timelines were a bit shaky when we got them out. So that's how we do it. All right. Thank you, folks. I really appreciate your time.